This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Good morning to you on this... Let me check my phone. Wednesday, December 14th. <laughs> Do you John, know where you are right now? Johnny, I didn't know the date nor the day of the week, <laughs> but now I do. I'm sure glad that I tuned into Real Talk. Yeah. Thanks for everybody joining us on the podcast, joining us uh, live streaming or otherwise on YouTube and, of course, on the Mixler audio app presented by our friends at California Closets. Before we get to our uh, first guest in studio, we hit the ground running this morning because we've got an in-studio guest, Omar Mualam, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, I wanted to remind you, if you've not yet signed up for the 2023 Three Real Talk Pond Hockey Classic. Today's a great day to do it. You go to ryanjesperson.com, you click on events, and then you'll see from that drop down menu, of course, pond hockey. We've, we've got some early bird incentives. So check out the website here. Uh, all teams that register before the end of the year, before December 31st, are going to be entered for a chance to win the Real Talk Pond Hockey Gift uh, Classic. This is the package uh, $250 gift card to Central Social Hall, $150 Real Talk Pond Hockey Beer Bucks. $100 in Dairy Queen gift cards and more. We've got room for just 36 teams, four or five skaters on each team. Of course, we're looking for volunteers and sponsors as well. All of the funds raised, all of the proceeds are going to benefit Kids Sport St. Albert and the Uncles and Aunts at Large Society. We're really excited about this. It's our second annual, raised $50,000 at our first annual last year. And this one promises to be just as fantastic of a Saturday. It's coming up February 4th. 2023 you can find all the details again at ryanjesperson.com just look at the events link and select the real talk pond hockey classic uh we uh we're, we're hot out of here omar <clears throat> there's no small talk today we want to go right to the to the issues and the stories that are driving people nuts and uh as let me officially welcome you to the show first author journalist filmmaker uh people know you well for the work that you've published of course in a number of of, of different publications most recently in mclean's we're going to get to a story there you've been in the walrus and a bunch of other stuff uh your most recent film the last baron uh documenting the rise of the popular the cult classic burger brand burger baron across the province of alberta you're, you're always working on something how have you been i'm doing great man how are you it's it, so nice to be in this new space isn't it it's good to be great. in studio to together i love this I love this. We love having you here, and uh, and, we, and we've got a lot to talk about. I'm I'm being a little bit facetious when I when I talk about the stories that uh, that that everybody's uh, talking about right now. But the the fact of the matter is, everybody's pissed off about a piece in Toronto life. This has nothing to do with anything that you're talking about. It has nothing to do with anything that but, you're but working on. But how can we on. help ourselves? Uh, but how, but how can we help ourselves? Did you have? I'm I'm assuming that you had a chance to read this. Yes. I moved to Alberta and hated everything about it. After three months, I came back to Toronto. Yeah, lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 the, this is a, a piece uh, apparently by by a gal by the name of Jackie Thomas has told to Alex Sear. Uh, it's accomplished what it was intended to accomplish at TorontoLife.com, of course, because they have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of clicks, so it's working. Uh, the headline, I moved to Alberta and hated everything about it. After three months, I came back to Toronto. I'm not convinced that it's actually real. It's totally real. But it's you're totally convinced real. that it's real. Tr Toronto Life... Um, has mastered the, this art of, of um, they're probably ghost written. They're like first person. I've done a few of these myself, yeah. but they're first person pieces um, that kind of look into people's often sort of lurid lives. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, they, it's, it's supposed to be, I mean, it's supposed to cause a little bit of outrage, um, but these are very popular pieces. And, um, you know, people, people love, love putting you know burying their personal lives out there um this is a story about a, a 33 year old woman named jackie who lived in mississauga and loved to go out to the clubs and go out for cocktails with her friends and wear high heels on a tuesday you know five times a week and um but also wanted to settle down a little bit has a six-figure salary and decides like oh Alberta's the place mm. and she she bought into the propaganda the the uh, the move west you know the move to Alberta propaganda that had been uh, proliferating across uh, Ontario and uh, she got here and uh, apparently she was moving to Edmonton but actually she was moving to 30 minutes south of Edmonton I don't know if that's Leduc <laughs> or Nisku and bought like a 1600 square foot home I think for $400,000 and then was shocked 
shocked that there was no nightlife. Nightlife. That her lifestyle didn't match up with this and became depressed as one would. I mean, I've lived in Edmonton for 15 years and I would also be depressed living in those conditions. <laughs> it's like the, the, the piece is amazing. This is why I feel... I just, I don't feel that, well, whatever. You're convinced it's real. It just seems to me like the, 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 if, if Jackie Thomas is a real person, uh, if Alex Sear is a real person, if Toronto Life is indeed a real entity, Omar, <laughs> if this is not something out of the city of Calgary, because this, this is perfect out of coming out of Calgary, uh, it's almost more perfect coming out of Calgary than out of Toronto. Yeah, I don't think she, Jackie would have loved living 30 minutes south of Calgary either. <laughs> Actually, it's pretty beautiful 30 minutes I, mean, I feel like she, had, I, she should pick a lane, yeah, right? Like, what, totally. what, what lifestyle do you want here? Do you want the quiet suburban lifestyle or do you want, like, the downtown urban lifestyle? And she wanted both and was shocked that she could not have that in, you know, in central Alberta. I don't even want to call it Edmonton. Mm -hmm. The greater metro uh, Edmonton area. Johnny, where's your head at with it? You well, read the I piece said to Ryan it? this morning, it's the equivalent in the States of somebody moving from like Chicago to Minneapolis. Like, what did you or a expect? Suburb, a, a suburb of, of Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Yeah, exactly. I, you know what? I think if she moved downtown Edmonton or White Avenue or something, I don't think she would have been as ha that happy either. Because, you know, like Toronto is a great, like it's a great yeah, city. Edmonton's That's not what Toronto. you're looking for, right? Edmonton's not Toronto. But she's also the not from the, Toronto. The propaganda she's from Mississauga. <laughs> yes, she's from Mississauga. She's not from Toronto. True, true but Mississauga is pretty well connected to, sure. to Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm from, yeah. the, I'm from the GTA as well, <clears throat> about 45 minutes outside of Toronto, but yeah. it's, it's nothing like living downtown in the city. Um, so I don't know how you could compare it. But I get, I get what she's saying. Toronto has dense culture, food, music, Absolutely. any night of the week you can go see reggae, rock, DJs, whatever. And Edmonton... You can wear your high heels on a Tuesday, exactly, on a Wednesday. <laughs> exactly. And, she, you know, Edmonton has diversity too in all of that, but it's just not as, you know, not it's as not much. It's not meant to be that. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, the propaganda that she bought into wasn't that, like, Alberta is a great place to... Um, you know, for a, a standard of living um, or to put down roots, buy a home, settle down. That stuff is all true. Um, I think the propaganda was that, you know, she would be happy with a 16, with a giant home to herself. Um, In the middle of nowhere. Well, you know, anywhere. I mean, that's not, <laughs> what are you doing at, at that, at that age, buying a 1600 square foot newly built home? I mean, <laughs> a quote, quote, not long after I made the move, I went out on the town by myself. I asked strangers where I could find a nice lounge with shisha and friendly 30 year olds. And they replied, what do you mean by a lounge? <laughs> Who is she talking to? Um, I mean, I would have been like, go to Red Star. They're not going to have shisha, but you know, you're, it's, it's, it's loungy. You're going to have a great time. There. Sure. And but, we, um, you know, it's true. We don't have a shisha lounge anymore. And you know what? I wish we did. That's a travesty, actually. That is. Don't you think? I think it is. Yeah. I think, but 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 then again, I'm not, uh, you know, I mean, hey, t to be honest with you, I've, I feel like, uh, don't smoke kids. I, I don't feel like anyone should be smoking cigarettes, and I think it's bad for your health. I also uh, think that cigars are fabulous, and I think that shisha has amazing cultural implications and brings people social, together. It's very social, It's very social. I think that people are grown-ass adults and can decide for themselves. And and I think that uh, as well, I mean, I, you know, I went to university in Vancouver right around the time that cannabis lounges were, were quite popular and quite prevalent, uh, you know, the so-called gray market yeah i live there but then you know the amsterdam cafe the amsterdam, amsterdam cafe, cafe. I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. you and i would probably we didn't we didn't know each oh, other oh i never stepped foot in oh line. you never stepped no, foot no, in no, never. oh no me neither omar uh i was just there doing research but um i personally would like to see uh you know entrepreneurs be able to keep shisha lounges and cigar bars and, and things like that open uh, edmonton does have the one cigar bar of course on on indigenous land um, but uh, but other than that, nothing. I, I guess there's really not a lot to say about this. Someone someone said like Toronto Life got you guys all hook, line, and sinker, and I get it. They did. They did. They and, did. And it works. And we actually love this stuff. We love being able to jump to the defense. I mean, this would be like people in New York making fun of Toronto, and then Toronto would have a hissy fit, right? When I saw this yesterday, I was like, oh, I kind of wish Stephen Mandel was mayor for a day, because he would like he would fall for this. I mean, he he would have like called a, a, a you know a.
press conference to address this article. Do, I mean, do you remember <laughs> when the when the um, the machetes? What was it? Oh, yeah, the machete wielding savages. Yes, uh, was that, that, that came uh, out? <laughs> yeah, that was. I'm trying to think. I'm, 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 I think it was a National Post piece. Yeah, and just like Mandel happened to be speaking at like the Business Association or something like that, or business. Chamber of Commerce, and just decided that he was going to go completely off script and <laughs> and address this, uh, yeah, this this horrible, <laughs> the machete wielding yes. savages, which which actually uh, at the time you'll remember Edmontonians embraced it wholeheartedly. They loved it. People were making <laughs> T-shirts about machete wielding yes. savages. You know, um, hey, uh, speaking of mayors off the script or off the record or, or thinking they're off the record, did you happen to hear this little blurb, Johnny? You heard this little blurb of audio from Edmonton's mayor, Amarjeet Sohi, yeah. uh, who, by the I way, we can, we can we can make the I'll bring you up to speed here in two seconds. Let me make an advance announcement. Tuesday, uh, December 20th, uh, his worship, Mayor Amarjeet Sohi, Edmonton's mayor, will join us live in the Real Talk studio. He's going to walk over from City Hall and join us here in the historic Mercer warehouse. We're looking forward to that. We'll Even talk after to this city discussion, budget. is he still going to Yeah, come? I don't know if he's going to come after this one. I know his chief of staff listens we were number one on her spotify unwrapped for the year so is that what it's called unwrapped i'm i do my wrapped. best to get wrapped unwrapped should be what we do uh but yeah so anyway the point is uh they're having budget deliberations and they're a little bit contentious right now the story of edmonton's council right now is really interesting we talked about it a bit on our most recent friday roundtable. people can check that out uh, a lot of municipalities are going through their budgets right now and edmonton's there's there's a there's a, a sort of a new tone or a new vibe to edmonton city council and and you could describe it as quite left-leaning and, and there's not technically a slate but in a way there might as well be there's kind of a voting block and it's an interesting story that people are, are watching and paying attention to and people want to keep property taxes low but they want to keep services high and this is the same almost mind-numbing conversation that talk shows have all the time about budgets yeah. but important right yeah. and they're talking about bike lanes and they're talking about whether or not they can afford to keep plans for a rec center and what have you and the mayor has his say and there are uh you know counselors in the mayor meeting in person at city hall but it's also like a zoom call it's also you know being broadcast in a way so people can participate and citizens can hear it and the mayor has the mic the mayor has the floor he wraps up his thought the moderator or whoever's quarterbacking the meeting says thank you mr mayor and moves on to the next speaker. And then you hear Amarjeet Sohi. I don't know if he's talking to his chief of staff or someone else who he's with. He says, they're spending like drunken sailors. <laughs> <laughs> and the mics pick it up. <laughs> and and people are going, oh, he's caught on a hot mic. He's caught on a hot mic. And, and, and Did when they I, react in, in chamber? No. no. And what I saw, what first put it on my radar was actually a few people that, that to, to be quite honest, I know did not vote for Amarjeet Sohi, that in a group chat of ours were like, to be honest, that impresses me. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, that's the most impressed I've ever been with Sohi. And, that's and, a bit of a mixed metaphor, though. Are, are drunken sailors known for for overspending? Is I, that I sw think swearing? That, I think they're they're known for swearing. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do they What do they spend money on? I think like, the idea is that when when sailors, uh, if we can just take an entire group of people and mm -hmm. just characterize them with one behavior. Uh -huh. uh, I think <laughs> one bad was, behavior. With one it's bad drunken behavior. sailors, they're never going. They, they don't really have a drunken sailors. Don't have a powerful lobby. They're never not, going to. They're not going to sue us. No. for defamation. Uh, and if they do, we're insured. Uh, but they'll they'll say uh, you know that they've they've spent so much time out at sea, Omar, mm. that they that they haven't been able to True. to like imbibe and and uh, you know socialize and interact with and they, and people got, to they whom they may be attracted. Something nice for their wives. Something nice for their overseas. wives and families. Yep, who I'm sure are forefront in their minds. So, I, but I wondered, I wondered, and and I think I know the answer. I, I think I'm being a bit of a conspiracy theorist or a provocateur here. I wondered, did so he maybe know his mic was still hot? Did maybe. he maybe decide to throw in that little barb? But I don't think so. Scripted something to seem unscripted. Maybe I think that's more likely than the Toronto Life piece being being fake. Yeah, I I just the Toronto Life piece. You know what? I, I always yeah, I, I, I mean, find it's, myself it's good politics, right? To like, you know, to 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 sort of gesture to, you know, not your base, the people who would not have voted for you. That like, hey, ideo ideologically. We might be we might be on the same team here. Yeah, 
Yeah, like I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I know you're not thrilled with what you're seeing right now, and I hear you. Uh, we're hanging out with Omar Mualam in just a second. I want to get into your McLean's piece. It was out. This is a, a, a brutal story. And as a matter of fact, I was telling you there's a bit of a personal connection for me. We'll get into that out of, uh, story out of Calgary. Serial abuse at a junior high school, John Ware High School. Uh, Omar's been reporting on this for a long time. And there's a new development, uh, almost a political and administrative development. We'll get into that in just a second. We wanted to remind you that Athabasca University right now braces for, for big web activity this time of year. Why? Because it's, it's obvious, you know, a lot of people, when you start looking to the end of the calendar year, the beginning of a, a new one, a fresh start, you start wondering what your next 12 months might look like. We talk about self-improvement. We talk about bettering ourselves, learning more, maybe preparing ourselves for a different career path. Athabasca University is Canada's open university with world-class accredited online programs and courses, flexibility to learn at your own pace. You heard Harmon Candola sing it on the show on Friday, his wife. Had some stuff pop up in her personal life, in their family life. Her Athabasca University studies, she was able to put them on hold until everything else stabilized. And then she was able to finish her degree. That's a real-life story from a real-life person that chose Athabasca University at AthabascaU.ca. Hey, the holiday sales continue today at McBainCamera.com. And of course, for those of you that right now have a creator in your life, somebody that just seems to capture those perfect images, that's always there telling the stories, you can save up to $500 right now on a huge selection of Nikon lenses during McBain's holiday sale. For capturing the finest detail, consider picking up Nikon's Z 105mm macro lens at $100 off right now. You can save $200 on the ultimate real estate and architecture lens, that's the Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter with the f 2.8. You can shoot in low light with great clarity. Or that Nikon Z 100 to 400 millimeter lens, this is a beauty. One of the greatest wildlife lenses available at a really great price. $350 off right now at McBain. You can see a full list of Nikon cameras, lenses, binoculars, all on sale for the holidays right now at McBainCamera.com and shop with confidence. Your purchase backed by 30-day price protection. You're always guaranteed the lowest price. McBain, create to inspire. And a quick shout out to our friends at Park Power. You know, they're aware. They're not going to hide it. They're not going to pretend like you don't know that your utility bills are going to be higher over the next few months. We use more natural gas. We use more electricity. Well, it means higher energy usage, so it's a great time to shop around for utility providers. You're like, I got so much on my plate. My to-do list is 10 feet long. When am I going to find the time to compare utility rates? It takes two minutes at parkpower.ca. Park Power's current fixed electricity rate plans are almost half the cost, half of the regulated rate option. You don't have to fear about being locked into a contract when you choose a fixed rate plan with Park Power because you can cancel anytime for free. You're not going to. Trust me. We brought our business over there and have never looked back. The promo code 2022-REALTALK knocks $70 off your first bill from our friends at your friendly local utilities provider, Park Power. And yes, I was stretching that out to hit the post, John. Yes, I was. Omar Mualam hanging out with us. Uh, This is a story, Omar, that you first published uh, in McLean's back in uh, November. And uh, I know that this is one that, that obviously horrified people across the country. It's a story out of John Ware Junior High School in Calgary. A monster in the classroom reads the headline. Michael Gregory was the most popular teacher there. Uh, but also a serial abuser preying on students for almost two decades. How did this story first wind up on your radar? Well, I think I I probably heard about it um, in late 2021, maybe early 2022. You know, by then, uh, it was pretty well known. He was charged with these um, sex-related crimes, 17 counts, in February 2021, and then five days later, um, killed himself. He was released um, pending a, a court appearance, and then went to Quadra Island and killed himself. And and um, the the victims who at that time, uh, when the charges were pressed, were about six women, uh, former junior high teachers. Basically, I mean, you know, justice was was sort of robbed from them. Um, but in November of 2021, they announced that they were going to sue the Calgary Board of Education for negligence. Um, and I think that's about when it got on my radar. Um, and about in April, I started to investigate it. And I spent the next seven months trying to figure out how 
this happened, not just the, the scale of his crimes, which were much bigger than, than I think people realize, much certainly bigger than, than I had uh, realized, um, but also how this happened. What did people know? Because the first victim um, was in 19, it was the first known victim, I should say, was in 1989, and the last known victim was in 2005. So that's 16 years. I mean, almost his entire teaching career. And a lot of it seemed like it was kind of blatant, the, the grooming and abuse. Um, that first victim, Kelly Schneider, in 89, mm. um, her parents actually, when they found out that she was in an inappropriate, you know, what she called then or what they called then an inappropriate romantic relationship with her junior high teacher, they, they went to the, to the administration of John Ware Junior High School, told them what was going on, and she was basically called a liar. And nothing was done. And for the next 16 years, um, he continued to groom and abuse at least 20 victims. Um, when I published this, it was 20. I've since received new leads. I think it might be at least 23 Jeez. at this point. And not just women, but also a lot of boys were physically and emotionally tormented by him. The Calgary uh, police detective, uh, Tim Timothy Fitzgibbons, who uh, is the lead lead investigator on this, he estimates that it could be 100 to 200 former students who were emotionally, physically, and sexually abused by Michael Gregory. Jeez. When your story broke, um, and, and there were rumblings before, like there, I was telling you off camera briefly that I had become privy to some of the, and this is very sensitive subject matter yes. for obvious reasons for a lot of people. The high school that I attended in Calgary, Henry Wisewood High School, John Ware is a big feeder school to that mm. high school. And when, when the rumblings started, and then when your story broke in McLean's, there was conversation among uh, former classmates of mine, former high school classmates of mine who were students of his. Mm. And I know that this has hit people uh, in, in, in very significant ways. Uh, the one thing that I took from it that I noticed, uh, I did not know him. I did not attend that school. But for most students, this did not come as a surprise, which was pretty powerful to recognize that this is when, when you allege or, or you've spoken to uh, in, in obviously in interviews with the Calgary police and otherwise more than 20 victims. Uh, it, it's it's hard to imagine how something like mm -hmm. this could have continued to happen. Do you have insights and, and into the administration clarify, that's, there? That's, that's female victims yes. of sexual abuse. Yes. Right? I mean, you're talking about over 100, uh, uh, if you want to say survivors as well. It's, that's certainly what, what the CPS with the Calgary Police Service thinks. So in, in, in your investigation here, uh, from the journalistic standpoint, and talking to the police that have investigated this, in, in, in the insights that you've been able to glean, how do you believe, I mean, parents or even former students are going to look and say, how does something like this happen mm -hmm. over the course of almost 20 years? That's a really good question. Um, there's, there, there are, I think, a number of forces that had to sort of collide here in order for him to get away with this for so long. There, I mean, th this isn't unusual, right? Like this does happen. Uh, I'm sure every junior high, high school, and even some elementaries over the course of those schools, you know, lives, they will have one or two examples of a, you know, of a, of an abuser or at least a groomer. Um, but something on the scale, a lot has to go wrong. And I think you can, you can start with the reason why he was hired and the latitude that he received. So he, he was hired in 1986, straight out of university. He had cultivated a reputation as like an outdoorsman, as a mountain man. And this was at a time when public schools, uh, most public schools didn't have outdoor ed programs. This was like a private school type thing. And they were eager to start, you know, offering this service. Yeah, uh, especially as this. a public school, exactly, right? Exactly, right? And so he was seen as like a great hire. He was a real, he was a big draw for John Ware School when he came in at age 23. Um, he was uh, unusual. He was quite his humor was very juvenile think think kind of Howard Stern like very raunchy mm. you know um kind of blue uh sense of humor would say like really really inappropriate things um but was kind of tolerated because he was also seen as someone who could connect with uh with teenagers who could kind of speak in their own language 
And um, he was given a lot of latitude because um, because he was so popular and because he was such a draw with this outdoor ed program. So he was allowed to basically autonomously design his own outdoor ed program from scratch, which allowed him to do things like take students on unsanctioned field trips to like scout hiking trails for the next field trip to right. take students with him to uh, mountain equipment co-op to buy new supplies for it, that kind of stuff. Um, and he was known for selecting, like for developing a bit of a click and always within that click having like one female teacher's pet, a favorite who would sort of be a bit of a, a almost like a teacher's assistant, but also, you know, someone he would nag and pick on, but also would favor. And so the first, the first victim in this story and the first one that we know, Kelly Schneider, she was that girl. She was, and, and she was kind of a prototype for the victims over the next many years. She was very popular. She had a bit of a rebellious streak, but she also was insecure. She had an eating disorder. Mm. She was um, someone who you know, really wanted validation, and clearly he saw her as a mark. Um, what else needed to go wrong there? Well, I think in the, early, in, the, in the 80s, early 90s, I think there was a little bit more tolerance of those inappropriate boundaries you know, uh, a teacher and a student having a relationship, even what was assumed to be a, uh, you know, a platonic one or, you know, a, a, well, like you write a, about a positive him, relationship like driving students around in his car Taking and having them to his to acreage, his, to his acreage, right, I mean, where they would, you know, supposedly um, do things like gardening and landscaping, you know, um, that he was giving them work experience. He would often target students who were seen as troubled. They, you know, had eating disorders or came from dysfunctional homes. Um, but then he would start to prey on them, kind of test their boundaries with inappropriate sexual jokes, inappropriate touching. Um, there are stories of how he learned that girls were being sexually active through like slut shaming rumors in a junior high and then leveraged that in order to prey on them. Basically, he would look for girls who were sexually active or try to make them sexually active with their age appropriate boyfriends. And then once they were, then he would bully and humiliate those boys in order to kind of redirect their attention to him. And so after, you know, after Kelly Schneider came forward, basically nothing was done. She was called a liar. She eventually changed schools. She did what a lot of sexual child sexual abuse victims do, which is, you know, you, you downplay it to yourself and to others, and you cope through denial, and eventually those memories start to blur, get blocked. But every once in a while, something would come along that would kind of trigger her. But she took some comfort in thinking, believing that she was the only victim. And of course, when the charges are pressed in 2021, she learns that she absolutely was not. And it, you know, the bold, the, the longer he got away with it, the bolder he became. And in the early 2000s, I, I couldn't believe it. I counted about seven, seven girls that he was actively abusing at that time in the early 2000s and grooming more. Um, <laughs> teachers, some teachers suspected things. Some of them had, you know, they ought to have known, and maybe they even did know. There was one teacher, d different women have told me this or, or have reported this um, anecdote. A specific teacher would see him getting close to some girls and then would come up to those girls and say, like, be careful, mm. right? Don't get too close to him. So obviously something was known. He was known to keep his doors closed, to obscure the window um, of his door so that no one could see. There are, you know, allegations that teachers had um, witnessed him grabbing girls' butts that had seen... Um, unclipping bras, you unclipping write Unclipping bras. He did this all, all in, you know, did all of this in plain sight, but... It's hard to imagine. It is. I mean, it really and, and, is. And, and you, you, like 1989, 1990, 1995, 2000 doesn't feel like an eternity ago. I don't know no. if as a society maybe we're more aware of huge red flags. I mean, these are like enormous red flags. Huge. These are like signal beacons totally. of an issue. There were, I've, I've counted at least six and possibly seven. I, I mean, I'm getting more leads. Parents who went straight to administration to complain about his behavior 
with Schneider's example, it was um, clearly, you know, an allegation of sexual abuse, but also sexual harassment of uh, physical abuse. I mean, this one kid who had his face shoved in manure um, by Gregory because he, he pissed off the teacher, his parents went there thinking like, okay, like if, <laughs> if there is a fireable, fireable offense, this is it. And nothing was done. I, th I think the boy was maybe moved out of his class. I can't quite remember. Eventually, the boy just changed schools, just like Kelly did, just like a lot of these kids who uh, were, you know, victims of some, you know, variation of his abuse. Eventually, their families just found it easier to take them out. We're talking to Omar Mualim. If you're if you're just tuning in, his piece at McLean's.ca, uh, the monster in a classroom at Calgary's John Ware Junior High. Uh, the development, the most recent development, you talked and you write about a class action against the Calgary Board of Education, but the, but the provincial government has stepped in here. Yes. And effective next month, uh, effective in January, the Alberta Teachers Association will lose disciplinary rights to a certain degree. Right. Can you provide some clarification yeah. here on Omar so where this is going? The ATA, which is, um, you know, it's, it's the teachers union for Alberta. Um, and you have to be a member in order to teach in a Catholic or public school in this province. Um, and but it's also uh, the disciplinary body for teachers as well. And many people, many critics have said this is a conflict of interest, um, that there should be an independent body. And in fact, Alberta and Manitoba um, are the last places where uh, the unions, teachers unions, uh, are also the disciplinary bodies. Um, the rest of them have gone, um, have, have set up independent bodies, um, sort of a college of teachers, or it is done by a uh, government commission, sort of an arm's length commission. And the, you know, the idea is that uh, teachers are supposed to be, you know, at least this is what the ATA would say, that they are the best ones to discipline um, their, their own profession. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in reality, there are maybe some conflicts of interest, there's some hesitation maybe to report on a colleague. And there are, there are rules in place in the, in the code of conduct that can get in the way of reporting a colleague that you suspect of misconduct. So number one is if you want to report that colleague to administration, to the school's um, officials, um, you first have to confront the colleague whom you want really? to report. Yes. Um, that is a code of, you break that, you're breaking a code of conduct that can backfire. Um, if <laughs> so, what the idea a, is try to resolve it first exactly, before you escalate exactly, it. Exactly. Right. So this is maybe, this is maybe fit. designed for more like interpersonal sure. issues, not for something like this, but there's no, there's no clarification, right. Um, in the code of conduct. And then, um, if you want to do a written report of that colleague and give that to administration, do sort of like an incident report, you first must show that report to the colleague and let them know that you're going to hand that in. Jeez. So these these can easily, like you think about what teachers are burdened with on a day, right? It's not just like marking and teaching and lesson plans, but also like you got to deal with like, you know, students' issues, parents, you know, internal politics, like to take on this one more thing I can see, I can easily see how it could be a disincentive. Now you can go over administration, go and fly direct to the ATA, and that's actually what the ATA wants. They want you to go direct with the reports. You don't need to go to the colleague. Um, but what I found is that teachers didn't know that they conflated the two rules, thinking that they must also still go first to the colleague before reporting them to the ATA. Um, if if a report event does make it to the ATA, then the ATA will start an investigation. They have their uh, their own investigators um, who investigate this misconduct. It might rise to the level of a hearing. It might be resolved without a hearing, um, and that is sort of like a uh, an internal court. Um, it's quite robust, and they they put, it's it's quite well funded. Um, and uh, but the issue is that it it rarely does make it there. So I was quite surprised to learn that there were only three times that Gregory was reported to the ATA. Once in 1998, and that didn't, you know, result, that didn't rise to the level of a hearing. I have no idea what the contents of that report were. It's, those documents have been destroyed. Um, again, in 2003, this is really interesting. Again, don't know what the contents were. Um, they have been destroyed, but three days, a couple days after that report against him, he retaliated against that colleague by making a, a report against the colleague who, 
accused him of something, some misconduct, and that was withdrawn. So he was, he was known to be very vindictive. He would, he would sometimes tell people like, I know people, I know people in the RCMP, I know people in the mafia. Uh, you know, he was, he was quite out there with, with his claims. Um, and that but, may have been stuff that was targeting or, or aimed at adult uh, yeah. accusers or those that were exactly. suspecting him. You write well, a lot, and I want to remind people to check out McLean's.ca because you also write about the way that he doctored or influenced the dynamic of the, of, of the junior. You, you think about how impressionable junior high yes. kids are. I mean, that idea, what was it, uh, uh, ATNA or ATNA, his yeah. all talk, no action thing. He would freeze yeah. students out. Of yeah, he was he was he was as he was a very skilled social manipulator. So coming back to you know some of the 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 privileges that he had, um, he he really was able to run his outdoor ed program however he wanted. And so he would do these these field trips, these canoe trips, and um, some of them sanctioned, some of them like outside of school. And he would, that's where a lot of the abuse would happen, right? Far away from, um, you know, far away from parents, other adults. And he would try to badger girls into undress somehow. One of the most frequent things that he did is like during a canoe ride, he would like dare them to like flash passersby, really like trying to test what they're willing to do. Mm. And if they weren't willing to expose their breasts, then he would, he would know like, okay, this is not someone that I can so easily prey on. And so he would ice them out, kick them out of the click, make them feel like an outsider. Um, and either that would make them want to come back and acquiesce, um, or that would just sort of, you know, kind of silence them, socially isolate them from the other girls that he was, you know, abusing. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite awful how he got away with it, what he did, but also how many students were very aware, well aware of what, what was going on, what they suspected. It's hard to imagine. It's a horrific story. Uh, obviously, it's a story that continues to have implications politically through administration and otherwise. I'm grateful that you're continuing to report on this, Omar, and that you've spent the time to bring us up to speed here. People can read your piece. They need to. A long-form uh, bit of investigative journalism by Omar Mualam at mcleans.ca, a monster in the classroom. Uh, you can also check out Omar's other work at omarmualam.com. We'll have all of the information down under the episode details, whether you're catching this on YouTube or on the podcast. Uh, despite difficult subject matter, it's so good to have you in studio. Thanks for having me. Thanks on. for making time for us. Here. We'll have to get you back to talk about The Last Baron. This is the, the film project that you've uh, been working on, and it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, we, we have a, a feature film version of The Last Baron titled The Lebanese Burger Mafia um, yeah. that we just finished, and it should be you know doing the festival circuit in just a, a matter of months. Okay, we'll get you back before that happens. That. Sound good? Thank you. All right, my man. Thanks right, for joining sure. us. That's Omar Mualim. Follow him on Twitter at Omar Mualim. In just a second, the CEO of the Calgary Zoo joins us. We're going to talk about the future of zoos. We're going to talk about the role that they'll play in conservation. Of course, COP15 happening right now in Montreal. This conversation is presented by our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy. Uh, they're providing solar energy solutions to power your life, and the solar conversation is a whole lot different now than it was just a few years ago. If your objections or your hesitations around installing solar are... Where am I going to put all the batteries in my basement? The solar panels barely last more than a few years, and it's winter. It's not even going to work. Well, that's not the case anymore. As a matter of fact, the efficiencies, the design, and the integration of solar is uh, really going to knock your socks off. The team at Kubi has brought me up to speed to better understand it. They can do the same with you, and they're also experts in understanding a lot of the subsidies, a lot of the grants, a lot of the programs that are out there to help you get solar on your roof for way less than you think it might cost. It's going to drop your cost down. It pays for itself quicker than you might think. You can get your free quote today at kubienergy.ca. Hey, speaking of sustainability and cool initiatives that companies are taking, uh, Mike and his team at Eden Landscaping have been working on this urban butterfly approach. And they're going to be, uh, of course, bringing that to front and backyards, bringing outdoor spaces to life again this spring. It's a perfect time of year now 
to get in touch with Mike and his team and ask about that. How they're integrating native grasses and drawing pollinators into people's yards, taking a whole new approach to landscape design. Why not put a consultation with Eden Landscaping under the tree for a loved one? Uh, Someone that's just sick and tired of the outdoor space just looking so uninspired, so bland, so boring. That's their business, bringing those spaces to life. You can find them online at landscapeedmonton.ca. Our friends at Local Environmental Services, of course, you know, presenting Trash Talk every Friday here on the show. Your chance to get whatever you need off your chest. Send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. You make sure you mention Trash Talk. And if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, if you're someone that's making decisions when it comes to waste management, garbage, recycling, water hauling, temporary fencing, maybe for music or holiday festivals, portable toilets comes into the mix in Edmonton, Whitecourt, Regina, an area across Alberta and Saskatchewan, local environmental services is providing better service, better prices, and more support for local causes. You can find them online at localenvironmental.ca. Well, you probably know if you're paying attention to the news cycle that Montreal, that Canada is playing host to the United Nations Conference on Biodiversity. It's COP15, uh, this on the heels of COP27, the climate change conference that was in Egypt just a short time ago. It's prompting uh, discussion across the country and around the world on what we're doing uh, to foster biodiversity, what we're doing to increase sustainability uh, across our endeavors. Dr. Clement Lantier is, uh, joined the Wilder Institute in the Calgary Zoo uh, coming up on 20 years ago as director of live collections. Uh, he was appointed president and CEO just a few years later. He's responsible for leading a, a high-performing management team and shaping the institution's vision. He leverages a distinct blend of of knowledge and values and skills to lead wildlife conservation organizations, uh, emphasizing animal welfare science and the customer experience. Dr. Lanche, making your Real Talk debut. It's nice to have you on the show. Thanks for making time for us. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to a free-flowing conversation here. I don't have a big, long list of prepared questions. I want to pick your brain on what biodiversity looks like through your lens, on what sustainability looks like, and, and how essentially the mandate of zoos has has evolved, uh, including the Wilder Institute, which we'll talk about. But where's your head at when you know as as COP15 uh, you know goes on in, in Montreal and people are talking about biodiversity around the world? So it's my first time that I attend the uh, a biodiversity conference like this, and there's uh, eighteen thousand people coming from all around the world, many many NGOs, but also the business uh, sector is is present this year. We have also the financial sector because we need to find a way to finance biodiversity. Obviously, we have many many nations that are uh, at the table negotiating, but it. We, we have to understand that biodiversity is not only about the animals. It's about you and me. We benefit every day from nature. The oxygen we, we breathe, the water we, we drink, the clothes we wear, the food we consume, the medication we have for our disease, all of this is coming from nature. So nature is not something that it's... Uh, different than what we experience every day. So by preserving biodiversity, it's about saving our own species. So uh, the we, we talked occasionally about the pollinator crisis. We talked about the elephant crisis, but all of those things are all getting together and we need to find a path, a different way forward to have, not to share that space, but to have a sustainable model that will provide better life for uh, human and for nature. And and here we get into, I mean, we could talk about pollinators for like six hours, right? We could talk yes. about elephants for a week. Uh, but, but I guess probably a, a big part of the mandate of a, of a conference like this is is to get people focused. I mean, to get global citizens focused on what they can do, uh, you know, metaphorically and otherwise in their own backyard, right? People are going to say, well, what can I do? Uh, what's yeah. my the one drop at a time that I can contribute to what we hope will be a wave of momentum? The, the, the idea here is to have a framework that will engage every country's uh, working in the same direction. And I think that the biggest, the lofty goal that we've talked about is to set aside 30% of the planet by 2030. 
So by protecting habitat, ocean and land habitat, mountain, marsh, everything, 30% of the planet by 2030. And uh, that's, that's the big, big objective. But to get there, we need to talk about poverty. We need to talk about building capacity. We need to talk about restoring ecosystem. First Nation stewardship. We need to talk about invasive species everywhere. We're talking about agriculture, pollution. Uh, and we need that framework that will come with measurable objectives. Because last time we met, they met, I wasn't there, uh, in, in uh, uh, G, uh, anyway, the, the objective were not measurables and we failed. 10 years later, we have not succeed delivering in any of the objectives that were set a decade ago. So we need to make sure that this time around, we have measurable objectives and each nation will have the ability to report on their progress on the 2030 uh, objective to set aside 30% of the planet. But we need, as I said, to account for all of those other stress that as a society we we see the invasive species and everything else that I list and restoring wildlife and wild places. And you will see probably your next question, what's the role of zoos? This is exactly where we operate. It's restoring endangered species in the landscape. Yeah, that is question down my list, but I want, I want to ask you, and I, and I am putting you on the spot here. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, and I wouldn't expect you to have an exact number, but if we talk about protecting 30% of the, of the land and the water, uh, you know, what, what would the current number be? Like for perspective, what is it now? Is it 5%? Is it 10? No, it's 17. In 17. Canada, it's 17%. In Alberta, it's 15%. So it's achievable. I think if we, if we partner with the First Nation, uh, if we uh, are uh, bold in our ability to set aside that, that capacity, I think we can a attain that objective. The challenge will be to, to set aside a diverse uh, uh, portfolio of ecosystem. Uh, south of Ontario, as an example, you know, the, the habitat is, is gone. So how can we restore those habitat? Now we have highways and, and uh you know, industries and airport, we houses. So th there's some habitat that have been have been damaged very, very severely. So how are we going to be able to restore and set aside some of this habitat? The prairies in Canada is one of the habitat that has been massively disturbed by agriculture. There's only a very small pocket of of uh, the ecosystem that is intact. And that's where we see a lot of endangered species in Canada because the habitat is gone. Can it be restored? I was telling you a story, just, just an anecdote on the show last week. A friend of mine uh, works for a, a First Nation here in Alberta. And they've just purchased uh, 200 bison, and they're going to be reintegrating them to the land. And, and he was explaining to me, it was kind of cool, and again, I have an elementary understanding of all of this, but he described that the, the bison dung uh, attracts certain insects and then the insects attract certain birds and then the birds attract certain predators and then the, pre you know, and he was sort of explaining to me, generally speaking, how this indigenous uh, tradition and understanding of, of sustainability uh, is, is manifesting itself present day. Uh, obviously we're not talking about, you know, rolling out 300 bison near the 401 by Toronto to try to restore that habitat. But once it's gone, can it be brought back? Um, with a lot of effort, that's why we need to protect the habitat before it's gone. Because when it's gone, it's it's it will be, it's very very expensive to restore. And there's some key stone species that are, are shaping habitat. Bison is one of them. Beaver is another very important one. Or prairie dogs, because you know once they have, have been reintroduced in the habitat, as an example, the prairie dogs. The burrows are used by uh, rattlesnakes and they're used by burrowing owls and they're used by uh, other species. And then the predators can come like the badgers and the black footed ferret can be reintroduced. And, and the predators, the, the hawks and, and many species will benefit from a very robust colony uh, of prairie dogs. And just, just like the beavers, they're shaping, they're architect of habitat. They, they will restore stream and they will store water and uh, from those ponds that they create, many, many species are getting benefits. So we need to select which species we need to protect first because they have a domino effect on 
probably, I would say, hundreds of other species. Does the average person in your assessment understand the the need for or the benefits of biodiversity? Like, does the average person on the street that that is concerned about their own life and paying their own bills and they want a house in the backyard that they can afford and then they want to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't want to sit in traffic. They want wider freeways. They want like, you know what I mean? Like, does the average person, how, how much of an uphill climb is this, I guess, is what I'm asking to bring the public on board. I, I don't think that many uh, citizens see see the link on that on that web, but uh, I think that's where we need to partner with uh, psychologists, educators, communicators, and uh, and not address this problem just with a group of biologists, because uh, you know we we speak the same language, we're passionate about what we do, but we need to. to to get many people under that tent and start shaping the conversation. We have to learn about the climate change people. The climate change was uh, issue was not on our agenda 15 years ago, just started 20 years ago. That was just in the, at the university that we were talking about this. And look today, every day you and I are talking or listening about something or reading something about climate change. It is it is shaping our conversation in our economy, our day-to-day -day life. So we have to learn the, bio, the biodiversity sector. We have to learn about how we can reach out to different audience and start moving the needle to make sure that we set aside enough space to protect our own way of life so the, as I said, the medication, the water that we, we drink, um, the fruit that, and the vegetables that we ate, the, the meat that we get, it's all about genetic diversity, biodiversity. It's coming from the landscape, the habitat, and we need to share this with enough species so we will continue to get benefit from this. So it's very, very selfish to set aside 30% of the planet by 30 by 2030 because we are also the one that will get benefit and how to get this in the mainstream conversation that's a big challenge it's no secret to you i'm, I'm sure you've heard it all about zoos uh, some people absolutely love the zoo they get a family pass every year they go there every weekend uh, some people can't stand the zoo they they have feelings of, of, of outrage when they see animals in captivity some people have mixed feelings and and i would describe myself as one of those people i think there's something magnificent about the animals i think there's a huge educational value being able to see them and also quite honest doctor sometimes it makes me sad to be at a zoo uh, how, how do you wrap your mind around it and how would your perception i mean you're you're leading policy you're the president and ceo of the calgary zoo of the wilder institute as well which people can check out at wilderinstitute.org how do you understand the, the mandate of zoos to be changing? And what would you say to, to those that are on the fence or to opponents of a zoo? I would say that good zoos, there's a nuance, good zoos are essential. Not maybe, not maybe uh, uh, 50%. Good zoos are fundamentally essential. We save species from extinction. We have, we operate a, a conservation breeding uh, farm outside of uh, Calgary, as an example, we breed endangered species for our reintroduction program. We have uh, 17 projects around the world. We are working on almost 30 species. And, uh, you know, it's not maybe, but we have saved species from extinction from our conservation breeding and reintroduction. But the knowledge to get to the breeding stage come from the knowledge that we have at the zoo. So, you know, our, when we were tasked to breed and to establish a conservation breeding program for reintroduction of sage grouse, boring owls, or Vancouver Island marmot, or a variety of species, we have been successful because we have the talent, because we have the expertise and the knowledge how to do this. But it doesn't reside only in our veterinary team. It's resided in our nutrition team, our uh, animal uh, care technician. It resides in our facility department because they know how to build, how to design space for a variety of species. So 
from the expertise that we have in zoos, we have been able to save species. And we not only at the Calgary Zoo Wildlife Institute, but a large, large and growing number of zoos have saved a variety of species across the world. Unfortunately, there's a lot and too many bad zoos mm. that are keeping animals in um, unsafe and inappropriate space. And uh, unfortunately, I share the same name with them, the ZOO, right? The zoo brand. But we we need to we need to work uh, around this. And there's a legislation that had been introduced in the Canadian Senate, the Jane Goodall Act, that is trying to address some of those elements. So we need better space, a better conservation program, education program, animal welfare standard to operate a zoo in this country but presently uh it's um it's very loose can can you see a world where like whether it's 10 or 30 years from now zoos are are being used to to uh foster or boost populations and reintroduce them into to wild habitats i mean like like okay so here would be like my dream my dream would be that the white rhino could be saved uh, dr launch and and uh and a number of zoos in in, in calgary and cleveland and, and around the world uh or is it cincinnati that has the big one cincinnati right uh they, they, they you know that they, they could reintroduce the white rhino and 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 to to where it belongs in these in these uh, you know reserves and safe from poachers and 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 a hundred years from now now there would be several thousands of them again. I mean, is that realistic or is that a pipe dream? For some, some species, that will be very difficult. The white rhino, it might be too late. There's uh-huh. a subspecies that we have only two females alive. That's it. So like we're on the trying planet, to mean. on the planet. So uh, it's uh, that that's probably uh, unachievable to the scale that we uh, we you just described. But as I said, we have and we are continuing to reintroduce species and release them in the wild and uh, in some cases we work with the local community to prevent species to be extirpated from the wild so the calgary zoo wilder institute we have a partnership with a small community northwest of ghana where we have established 20 years ago an hippopotamus sanctuary but we work with the local community uh constantly and we have now i i I can call them friends. We have friends working for nature with the guidance or with the support, financial support from the Calgary Zoo Wilder Institute. So we support their uh, uh, their uh, wildlife officer. We support their guide. We support the, the, the people working at the, at the lo- uh, lodge that we have built. We build schools. We build with them. Uh, Shea butter factory so the women can collect the nuts in the sanctuary during the day where the hippopotamus are grazing at night. So it has to be a win-win opportunity for the local community to protect wildlife and wild places. So zoos, that's what we do. And I can have and share with you dozens of of, uh, very, very profound and meaningful, impactful experience where zoos have been the instrument to connect people to protect wildlife in their habitat or occasionally to breed them in captivity and being reintroduced in, uh, in a different um, in different countries in different habitat when the habitat has not been restored or it's not ready yet for translocation. Mm. I'm grateful that you've made yourself available for this conversation. I know it's 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 a hot button one, obviously, and and uh, I mean that you take a look at sort of the the controversy that has swirled around uh, and feel free to jump in at any time. I treat this like a conversation, but you know, the documentaries that have been made about sea world as an example and how people have felt about, about like orcas in captivity. I mean, we're, we're talking to you from Edmonton where it, it, it it's hard to imagine that the mall here had kept dolphins for many years in the mall like it, it, it until people's appetite for that was gone and then and then maybe people care a little bit less i'm being facetious but they care a little bit less about sea lions so then they got rid of the dolphins and brought in sea lions and then people got outraged at that and then they brought in penguins and you get the idea um yeah. and, and and we look around the world i mean in edmonton right now at the valley zoo every you know many people are there's another campaign now to to free lucy they see lucy the elephant that's been there for many years and and, and people would argue that edmonton Edmonton's not an appropriate place, so the venue's not appropriate for an elephant to be there by herself 
as a social animal. But the, there are these movements around the world uh, where, where people are starting to demand more from, from zoos or, or, or facilities that would hold animals in captivity. And, and I appreciate your willingness uh, to talk about well, it. Well, I would say, you know, you, you also see seven to 800 million people visiting zoos every year. That's, that's one tenth of the world population are going every, every year to a zoo. So there, there is that fascination to see and to connect in some shape or form to the variety of, uh, of uh, what the animal kingdom is offering. So that's, that's the opportunity to connect people to wildlife and wild places. So there's a social element of going to a zoo that it's not negligible at all. So we need to take advantage of this. And this is why we have education uh, department, we have interpreters, and we need to invest more in the science of how we can shape the opinion. Mm. So we need to take advantage of those 700 million people that are coming to zoos. But the challenge that I see is we need to define what's a good zoo. And this is where we need legislator to, I think, to define, help us to step, uh, to, to walk away from keeping animals in inappropriate spaces, in an appropriate social group, and without the purpose. And the purpose I see clearly that is conservation and education. It's both. And, uh, but not only for uh, generating revenue to, uh, so the, I think the, the time of circus, it's, it's gone mm. and uh, we should not use the zoos to be uh, a different type of circus, but come and visit the Calgary Zoo or visit the Wilder Institute website and you will learn how much we are every day impacting wildlife in wild places, mostly in uh, Africa and also in Western Canada. Are the majority of, of animals, if you get a new animal to a zoo, is, is it either an animal that's, I don't know the proper word, but like orphaned? I mean, is an animal that's been orphaned in the wild or an animal that was born into captivity? I mean, like they're not like throwing nets on animals in the wild anymore and bringing them to zoos like 100 years ago, are they? Uh, no, absolutely not. So uh, a matter of fact, we try to control breeding of uh, the majority of species that we have at the zoo because we have limited space. And uh, we need to control the genetic the genetic diversity. So we right. have we are coordinating this um, with computer uh, software that will tell us that to optimize the genetic diversity of this species of large calf, maybe a snow leopard, you need to acquire uh, an animal that it's in Seattle, and you have to acquire another another one that it's in uh, Singapore. You need to get them together, and then you need to wait for. Um, maybe a couple of years because because you need to uh, the aim is to optimize a genetic diversity in 200 years time frame so if you're doing this too soon and so there, there's a lot of science behind keeping animals and moving animals it's not only uh, getting the first animal and try to breed uh, anything at any price so there's it's it's about protecting the genetic diversity for potentially use those uh, animals for insurance population for reintroduction in the wild. Mm. I'll give you an example. Mm. Tigers. There's more genetic diversity of tigers in North America managed population than there is in the wild. That's, that's very well established scientifically. So are we going to be able to release tigers in, uh, in uh, Siberia or in the Amur um, Valley? Probably not. However, we might be able to use uh, a cub or two and swap, you know, those those kittens at very, very early age, release them under a, a wild female to add some genetic diversity in the in the wild population because it is at risk. It became less than 400 uh, Siberian tiger or a mere tiger in the wild at one point. Now it's climbing back again but it's about having the insurance population available to support the wild population so when i said that it's just one example but when i said the zoos are scientifically managed and driven there's a lot of science not only on the veterinary medicine not only on the nutrition 
but also on the animal welfare, on the behavior of those animals in a variety of ways. So uh, we need absolutely, when you decide to go and visit a zoo, ask yourself, is it a good zoo? Is it an accredited zoo? And uh, you have to decide if you want to keep supporting uh, a roadside attraction or a credible uh, facility. Yeah, it's it's mind blowing. I mean, I oh gosh, can I? I was actually this has just occurred to me. You say roadside attraction. I mean, I'm 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 guilty of thinking of maybe a little too locally, uh, and I'm thinking of ones in and around our neck of the woods. I mean, even in our home province of Alberta. I mean, what about the what about the bombshell docu series Tiger King? I mean, like did, did something like that. How did that resonate? In, I mean, I should mention, by the way, and if you're just joining us live streaming audio on Mixler or watching us on YouTube, we're talking to Dr. Clement Lantier. He's president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. I mean, this guy's the big cheese. If you want to talk about zoos, this is who you want to talk to. What sort of a, a, a reverberation did it send through, through your community of zoo administrators and scientists and researchers, the whole Tiger King thing? Was it positive in that it got people realizing about some some of the can I say maniacs that are running some of these operations or, or was it negative in the sense that people group all of these facilities together and, and deem them to be unacceptable? That's a nightmare. That was a nightmare. That was a gong show. And uh, that's why it was good television because it was so uh, controversial and good image, you know, baby tigers. And that's why he was successful business wise, no ethics, no concern about the welfare of uh, of the animals and uh that was a, like a puppy meal he was just breeding animals to go to vegas for uh to take pictures and uh get get the money so uh that that was not a good a good day for good zoos for sure because uh because we we were being asked a lot of question about do we support this do, do we endorse this but we don't have to go in the united states this is happening in canada like the we same have sort of in this country, uh, you, you need a license to have a raccoon, but you don't need a license to have a, a tiger or a lion. So uh, in your backyard, this because there are you know indigenous spe- uh, species and exotic species, and some in some province it's it's the far west, but you know it's there's no legislation that is governing the health and safety of people or species. And uh, presently, you can have an alligator in your in your bathtub. You can have uh, primates uh, in your backyard. You can own a tiger or a lion. And again, this is, people will say, oh, that's a zoo. That's not a zoo. This is something, this is someone that should not be al- allowed to keep venomous snakes as a pet. Uh, you know, we know better than that now. And I think we need to protect, we need better legislation to protect people and to also ensure that the animals have the best care that they deserve. Uh, so this is where good zoos are also lobbying the government to add some uh, better legislation uh, because uh, pe- stuff like Tiger King should not happen again. Dr. Clement Lachi, I had no idea. People... So, so someone like could be flying under the radar legally owing a lion? Like, oh, the, yes. like where, a... does it matter where you are? Can I be the city of Edmonton with a lion in my backyard? Uh, I think in Ontario, there's, uh, there's hundreds of large cats kept in, uh, in backyard or a roadside attraction on accredited facility. So it's just an expression of how loose it could be. But, um, you know, jeez. Yes. Hey, thanks for making time for us. Um, I knew this was going to be a fascinating conversation. I'm looking forward to welcoming you to the show again. Dr. Clement Lachi, I know you've got a busy day, obviously, with COP15 and everything else. Uh, President and CEO of the Wilder Institute, the Calgary Zoo, and president of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Uh, we're showing uh, right now. How do you how do you pronounce this, uh, doctor? Is this, is Wachow. It, Wachow. You're, you're an honorary chief uh, of yeah. this, this sanctuary in northwest Ghana. You want to tell us about this real quick? Oh, it's an amazing story. 20 something years ago, the zoo started a relationship with that community. And, uh, you know, fast forward, we won the United Nation Ecuador Prize for uh, this place being the most impactful community based conservation in Africa, project in Africa. So it's about supporting the community 
protecting uh, the hippopotamus population, but by protecting the population of hippopotamus that are quite quite big animals, you need enough space. Many other species are getting benefit, but most importantly, the community are getting benefit. Now they have an ecotourism uh, industry established in that community. And as I said earlier, we, with a donor, a major donor from Calgary, we have been able to raise money and build a Shea butter factory in the community. And it's owned and operated by 2000 women. So they, they go in the sanctuary during the day, they collect the nuts, the Shea nuts, and they come back outside of the sanctuary. They, they proceed the, the nuts in butter and that's, that space is used, the, uh, the sanctuary, for a gra- as a grazing ground for the hippopotamus during the night. So yeah. it's a win-win. The hippopotamus are winning. Biodiversity is winning. There's, a, there's carbon sec- se- uh, sequestration, know, yeah. yeah. Yes, in the, in the habitat that is protected. And the village are getting more and more revenue. So the kids are going to school. Uh, they have better health care. Uh, they everything it's it's a very success story so we have this in Wichau we have a similar project in Avu Lagoon another region of Ghana we have another project with the Bongo Mountain Bongo in Kenya fundamentally the same uh, same approach we work with the local community to make sure that they get benefits sustainable benefit by protecting the land protecting the species and they they get better way of life same thing also in uh, Madagascar. We work with the local community to uh, rebuild a forest and eventually translocate and see the, the uh, lemur coming back. Huh. So it's empowering local community. So when you're visiting the Calgary Zoo, there, you have to understand that there will be some of this experience will support meaningful, impactful conservation initiatives in Africa, but also in our own backyard. We have a, a long list of species from Alberta that we are very, very uh, much involved, and um, we're very proud of what we do. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking right now at the drop-down menu. People can check out wilderinstitute.org, the black-tailed prairie dog. Uh, I saw in there the, the foxes and, and, and all kinds of whooping cranes, obviously the swift fox, Vancouver Island marmot, and more. Uh, again, wilderinstitute.org. We've been talking to Dr. Clement Lanchier. Uh, thanks for your time. We, we, we kept you longer than we asked for, uh, but uh, we appreciate your, your candid conversation about this. Okay. Have a great day. Yeah, you bet. You too. Uh, I can't say I know too much wow. about Ghana, but I'll tell you, it was, like, like, it was in Ethiopia a long time ago, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and for him to even say that, you know, that, that, uh, that this is owned, talking about the shea butter operation, and, and he says it's owned by women. Um, that's that's different than saying that here. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's some women that opened a, a business, and you go, that's great, good for them. There, um, at least, and, and again, I, I'm recognizing that Ghana and Ethiopia are two different countries, and and and. But the stories that I was able to tell there, doing this mini shooting a mini doc back mm-hmm. in the day about, was that that, that um, women and and girls as well. Like he talks about it, providing educational opportunities, uh, girls in in many of those countries um, were barred from from attending school uh, property ownership or business ownership, securing loans was, mm-hmm. was like, forget about it. Um, so it's always interesting to see when, when initiatives in this case, sustainability or biodiversity can have um, some tangible impacts as well with, with the human population yeah. and, and, and sort of have that multifaceted benefit. So, <laughs> interesting stuff right <laughs> like you're looking at me the whole interview like wow well because wow, because wow. like four or five days ago on the show you were pretty candid you shot from the hip well, i'll be i'll be candid right now i don't think zoos should exist but if they're gonna exist i want that doctor running them because That's pretty cool right the majority of what he's talking about is conservation biodiversity um he seems to know a lot about re-entering wild animals into their natural habitat again and how we can continue to do that. But, you know, at the same time, with everything he's saying, I'm still, I'm looking at stats, you know, animal abuse over 70% in all the zoos in the world. Uh, nine, over 90% of elephants are used for entertainment, mostly in zoos and are treated poorly. Yeah. Uh, only 18% of captive animals are endangered. So there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of things back and forth. And I'll just say it, like, I don't think Zeus should, and these are stats. What's from your source? Nat like, where Geo, you, okay? This no, isn't PETA stats, Great. all right? 
Um, oh, but, I love that you said But let's also say, no, and, I, and I'm not people, an apologist for zoos. I told the doctor myself, no. I have mixed feelings mm-hmm. about it. But he would, I'm sure, agree with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, he said the days of the circus are done. We need to better accredit zoos. There's zoos, zoos, mm-hmm. you know, in quotes, that are operating within 90 minutes of us right here 100%. that are deplorable. Horrible. And I Horrible. Came, I came, you know, I'm from Ontario. We had the largest privately owned zoo in Canada for the longest time. It was in now called Clarendon, Bowmanville Zoo, sure. until it shut down. For three years, the owner, Michael Hackenberg, you can Google him, uh, he was caught on video, secret video by, not PETA, but yeah. the, the Canadian equivalent, uh, whipping tigers. Over and over, trying to get them to perform in entertainment. He took an, he took a monkey on a talk show and got so heated, he started berating it and yelling profanity at it. And this was on live television. Yeah, so, so imagine behind the scenes. Yeah, right? but I, I do like how the doctor said bad zoos over and over. And yeah. we know that the majority of them are bad zoos. But there is that, you have that childlike feeling. Why do you think I love animals so much? Because I grew up in a town where we had one of the largest zoos in Ontario. I would go there. I would look at my zebras were my favorite animal. I was like, why is this horse painted black and white? And I know we have the internet nowadays. I know we have Instagram and we have high definition video where children and for educational purposes, you can look at animals, but there is nothing like seeing a wild animal right up close. Yeah. Two feet from you yeah. looking it in the eye. And I still remember doing that. Yeah. And I, I know that's with me today, and that's one of the reasons I, I love animals so much, and I don't want them to be in prisons. But at the same time, would I know that feeling if I hadn't seen them up close? I'm with you. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm so torn. I get like it. It's... Like I see a, I see a, I see a, and, and and you get the perspective, and we get understanding, and and uh, I don't have all the sources in front of me to cite them all, but but like I encourage people, and and I'm th- this is an engaged audience, as if we need to. You're already doing your own. You're already doing this, but like well, look at the chat. Watch the documentaries. We'll get to the chat in a yeah. sec. But I mean, you 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 learn about how intelligent. Um, an orca is, or or a dolphin is, or some of these these uh, these beautiful mammals that we kept mentally, in these emotional. aquariums, yeah. um, and and elephants, and and the empathy that animals can share, and, and then you you go to places where they're being kept in inappropriate enclosures, and you just you feel like shit for being there. Yeah. You, you you feel like shit for paying admission and for supporting it, and and then that's why I think this conversation is important too, because I want to have an informed understanding of what's going on. Oh, I uh, was ready to hate this guy, somebody- and then two minutes in, I was like. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, people, I, I saw somebody in here say, w- wondering, you know, someone, uh, I wish I could cite your name. The chat's going right now, so I lost your comment. But someone said, do you remember during the Calgary floods in 2013 and there was the concern, the very real concern, I understand it, that the hippos would yeah. be flooded out of their enclosures and, and would find their way into, into the Bow River and be gone. Mm-hmm. I've encouraged people time and time again to check out the Nature is Metal Instagram account. It's only it, it's not for everybody. OK, this is real life. They've got more than four million followers. Instagram dot com slash nature is metal or at nature is metal on Instagram. This is real life stuff. I mean, if you want to see this, the most recent post, I don't even know if I want to show it. There's there's a couple getting married there, Did you see this? I saw you're, you're not going to like this, I but this is real life. Hey, <laughs> nature's metal, man. They're, they're getting married and, and they're on the shore and on the shores of this beautiful lake. And as the wedding ceremony is underway, a grizzly bear is taking down uh well it, it's taking down a, a calf a, a moose calf like on the on, on the side of the river and, and the bride's going oh my like that that's sort of the, the type it's of crazy thing. so now, that's not necessarily what i wanted to bring up i wanted to bring up the hippos hippos dr lanche talking about the hippo the magnificent hippo and mm-hmm. the work that they're doing hippos are so bad ass if you look <laughs> check this out i mean if you're listening on the podcast i'll try to describe it but you got to see this for yourself this is just a few days ago on nature's metal check this out there's three lions okay three male lions uh, that are trying to make a river crossing okay and they're they're cautiously like it's sort of i think it's well known that lions don't necessarily love being in the water well check out mm-hmm. this hippo coming out of nowhere look at how fast this thing comes over look at this hippo and he comes <laughs> over this is a massive animal that's making its way over the lions and it lets them know who's the boss it lets them know whose turf this is and uh, one lion's like hell no he goes back to the other side and and then the hippo kind of polices the water the lion's got to fight to stay alive here the hippo has got to be you know that there are more deaths on land from hippos 
than any other animals aside from mosquitoes. Do Mala- you have Mal- hippo insurance? Malaria, <laughs> malaria is the number one killer, and like hippos are number yeah. two. And you were talking about the bear and the fish. That happened to me in Kelowna. So we were, I was doing, I was DJing on a beach. I'll give a shout out to the the, sure. the, the Okanagan Beach Club. My friend owns it. And we saw these small cubs, two of them, come down right by the water. And they're looking around. They're they're putting their paws. They're looking for fish. And everyone goes up and they start taking photos. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing nature. And what happens next? You know what happens next. Uh. Mama or Papa, I don't know, comes down from the hill. Yeah. And we all realize very quickly that nature is metal as well. Probably Mama, yeah. yeah frothing, at the, yeah. not frothing in the mouth, but very angry. Very upset. And uh, But yeah, it's like... Y- y- those experiences don't happen that often. So still torn on zoos, but very, very happy that we had the guest today because he was, he was, he seems like he wants to help animals. And he uh, agreed that the majority of zoos are not doing that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mark's listening in, you know, Mark Doran, he's been a a fierce uh, uh, defender of public lands and, and uh, his, his jam Mark is, uh, you know, really trying to hold energy, big energy companies to account with regards to land reclamation and and orphan wells in particular. This is good news. A report from Mark in our live chat says he says he's seeing more species on this family's land than they used to by far. Uh, He says this year, in addition to the gophers, and that's good news. I mean, unless your horses are stepping in the gopher holes and breaking their legs. But other <laughs> other than that, and I'm not laughing, that's not funny. But he says, in addition to the gophers, and what do you think is drawing these other animals of in? Course. It's the gophers. Yeah. He says, lynx, fox, coyote, deer, moose, eagles, hawks, blue heron. Uh, so very cool stuff. That's, that's I like hearing good news, too. Like, we always hear bad news. Like, you know, the world is dying. Uh, you know, the, the rainforests are disappearing. Yeah, burning. But there is good news. Do, sure. you know, do you know there's like uh, there's more uh, forests in North America than there were 30 years ago now? Hmm. Just because of all the replanting and things we do now. So, like, there is good news. And I know people are out there and they're trying to do good things. But at the same time, if we go back to this. You know it. You felt that you talked about it. Like mm. just seeing an animal. Uh, what was the stat I looked at right here about uh, polar bears? Yeah. So uh, polar bears have a million times less space than they normally would in zoos than they would if they were out roaming around. So because just, polar bears just, are bosses. Oh, dude. And they, the amount of the, the, the distances they will swim. And actually, there's there is a sad. OK, now we have two non scientists talking about this. So. <laughs> Don't, you know, let's let the doctor. Back let, in. Let's 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 bring him back in. Uh, call him back out of his meeting at COP15. No, but but fact check everything that Johnny and I are saying here. Obviously, that's but why I went to Nat Geo. I went to like I didn't go source. to PETA or something. But you look at uh, at what's happening with with uh, you know the, the Great Melt and the mm-hmm. the ice caps disappearing and everything. And this is all part of the bigger conversation. And polar bears are capable of swimming great distances, and it's remarkable, and they're amazing animals. But it's also not great the distances that many of them are being forced to swim because their frozen habitat or the habitat is disappearing. I mean, there's there's, there's a gut wrenching element to that. And isn't that the story with all wildlife populations right now? They're just getting yeah. pushed. Even here, if we talk about coyotes here here in Alberta, like why do you think? People, they're coming in people's backyards. They're, they, you know, they're yeah. being pushed slowly and slowly closer and yeah. closer to civilization. If and you want to see a mountain lion, natural, right? mountain lion take out a coyote, you can find <laughs> that on Nature is Metal. But as I well. loved how he said, "Hey, we need to conserve thirty percent of the earth for animals." I love how he started off with that. I was like, "Yeah, oh my gosh, I love this guy." And mentioning like, con- and, and, and mentioning not just consultation, but partnership with and collaborating with indigenous communities. Amazing. Um, you know, I mean, which seems to now be an obvious thing. It should be like uh, the first thing you think of. It always. should be the first thing that you think of. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot going on, obviously. I, I like this that, you know, we're having people on here saying more of this kind of stuff and less politics. And we're always, <laughs> <laughs> we're all, but we're always walking that line, aren't we? Because yeah. we want you to know, I mean, yeah, there's stuff happening in federal politics. Uh, you know, Sapria and myself, and of course, John, the producer of Seriously at SeriouslyPod.com. Today, there's going to be a new episode episode out today and we'll be talking some politics and we'll be talking some real life outside politics as well we always want you to know what's going on but we also recognize that politics is not life and death for everybody all the time Mm -hmm. right i mean why don't we why don't we head out to the mountains right now every every wednesday we have an opportunity courtesy of our our friends at at tourism jasper to celebrate the beauty uh that is found in jasper national park it's my jasper memories every wednesday here on real talk presented by tourism jasper if you're headed to the mountains over the holidays, maybe even as early as, I don't know, today? What about maybe this weekend? Here are three things 
that you've got to do in Jasper. I just checked out SkiMarmot.com. So this is a current report. Look at this. All main runs through the mountain are now open. Not every mountain in the Rockies, not every ski hill in Canada is even close to being able to say this. But Tres Hombres, Eagle East, Charlie's Bowl, if you know, you know. Fabulous conditions being reported across the mountain. You can check out all the details at SkiMarmot.com. And of course, make sure you get that escape card, uh, which means that basically uh, you're going to be paying half price to ride the mountain all season long. That's the escape card at Marmot Basin. There's also skating uh, beneath the mountains. And I talked to you about baby's first skate when Wyatt Rudy, when our now Mm seven-year-old, a hockey star who scored five goals his last game, no big deal. No big deal. His first skate ever was on Lac Beauvair uh, around the Fairmont Jasper Park Lodge property. And it was so very special. And then Journey Bike Guides. And you can learn more about this at jasper.travel slash January. They've got some great details there. Uh, Journey Bike Guides has their new fat bike tours, John, and they're Mm -hmm. perfect for the winter months. They got these big fat tires. Obviously, they can munch through that snow. They can handle everything, giving you an amazing opportunity to fill your lungs with that fresh mountain air. We invite you to welcome the lighter side of winter at the annual Jasper in January celebration. It kicks off on, uh, well, it kicked off yesterday, as a matter of fact. And of course, it's going to be running through till January 29th, the end of the month. Uh, Jasper in January bigger than ever uh, in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. It brings Jasper alive with really fun events. Uh, what am I talking about yesterday? It's, we're still in December. <laughs> I'm just excited. I'm going out there, and I'm excited <laughs> to get out there. It's January 13th. What am I talking about? January 13th to 29th. It'll be alive with really great events, delicious food, and cherished winter activities that all ages will enjoy. You can check out all the details online, jasper.travel slash January. Click on the activities event, the events and activities, and you can filter through exactly what you'd be looking for. Outdoor, indoor, daytime, nighttime, family friendly, educational, 18 plus, you name it. I mean, sleigh rides, a pond hockey tournament. They've got their famous street party complete with fireworks, live music through the evenings, but there's some new events as well, including the poutine showdown. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Local restaurants are going to vie for the title of Jasper's top poutine. It doesn't get any better than that, my friend. Or a taste of Ukrainian New Year's festivities at the Mountain Malanka event, a new festival exclusive theater tour experience. Four performances across four locations. I will be out there. I hope to see you out there at Jasper in January. You can learn more at jasper.travel slash January. And of course, we'd love to see your photos or video highlights posted on Instagram, Twitter, using the hashtags MyJasper and RJ. On a There's tough, a lot going on in the world right now. There I feel is. Like, I feel like we could have had a two-hour show today. Yeah. Did you want to touch on... Uh, we were already an hour and a half. I think we we should talk about it tomorrow, but yeah, there's... Why know, don't we talk about it now? Why don't we go into overtime? Okay, because, just quickly... Because there's there's kind of a gut punch story you've just shared. Uh, to get yeah, people a, a, the a show, peek so. behind the scenes, this happened during the show. Yeah, so the and, DJ from uh, you know Ellen DeGeneres' show, uh, DJ Twitch, as he's known, uh, passed away. 40 years old, apparent, years apparent old. suicide in a hotel room in Los Angeles, uh, which, again, is just <laughs> insane. It seemed like <laughs> like every uh, male you see that passes away from suicide, l- an incredibly happy guy. I mean, look at this family. Three kids, a beautiful wife, so pretty, pretty sad stuff. And another reason to check in with n- not only men, but everyone you know who you think isn't feeling too great. Yeah. I appreciate that you bring that up. It's something that, that we've made a commitment to on this show to talk about mental health and, and to talk about it in mm-hmm. a way that uh, reminds each of us about the importance of connection and mental health supports. Um, but you make a great point, especially at this time of year. You know, you're going to have a lot crazy, of people. Though, a guy so successful. Yeah, but it also like, has nothing to do with that. Right? I know, but it just it blows your mind when this stuff happens. And like you said, right yeah. before the holidays, like what? Yeah, these problems people have these mental issues. They, I mean, they don't take vacations. No, like they just. We lost a friend to suicide, and and we'll miss him forever. And and I remember the conversation relatively soon after it happened, and and a whole bunch of us that, you know, some of the guys that played football with him, some of you know some of the guys that partied with him, that hung out with him, a couple of people that had their their summer jobs with him, all were like, 
he was the most popular guy. I mean, it's all the things that don't matter. You mm-hmm. talk to somebody that's that's living with a mental illness or that's wrestling with their mental health or that it's been a constant uh, journey for, or a battle for them, and and these things are irrelevant. Mm-hmm. But but people were like, he had a nice car. This guy's like 19, 20 years old. He had a nice car. He had a beautiful girlfriend. He had a family that loved him. He had a younger brother that adored him. It it, it was irrelevant. Um, and it didn't matter. And, 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 and I, I think that probably the two most important words you said are check in. Yeah. Like I, I, I say it to you all the time. I'm like, how are you doing? And you know, but you mean we, it when you ask we me, we say the same thing every it. time. And I think men do this a lot. Oh, I'm doing good, man. Doing yeah. great. How are you? But like, then I look at you and I say, no, but really, yeah. like, how are you doing? Because yeah. you need to ask people like that. Stephen boss, 40 years old, successful, beautiful family takes his own life. It can happen to anyone. So can happen to anybody. Absolutely. We appreciate those of you that take the time to share with us where your head's at after you've uh, participated in a show, whether it's watching it live or downloading it later. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the support of our sponsors. Uh, and that includes our friends at Urban Timber. Of course, you know that that every week they're presenting our Real Talk Roundtable on Fridays. It's uh, And pointed out, I appreciate my panelist, Jenny Adams, this past Friday, our table is not indeed round. <laughs> but it is beautiful. Okay. It's a beautiful white oak table that was designed and built by the amazing team at Urban Timber. They've got a brand new showroom open, and you can go see them at their new location. Or, of course, you can browse their inventory online, urbantimber.ca, including their box car collection. These are, these are like, for the most part, fur timbers that have been, uh, I mean, harvested. They're many, I mean, in some cases, not just many decades, in some cases, they're more than 100 years old. Uh, they're pulling them out of uh, reclaimed rail, car, rail cars. They've traveled millions of miles across North America. And after they're reclaimed, they're, they're cleaned and they're sanded. They're filled with epoxy and a, and a food safe coating. And they're turned into these custom tables. Uh, no two look alike. A boxcar table will guaranteed capture the attention. It'll fascinate visitors to your home and every single day that you're cooking or sitting around with family members around your box car countertop you'll value that investment that you made with urban timber we encourage you to check them out online at urbantimber.ca every saturday their showrooms open in west edmonton you can grab the address off their website or shoot us a note we'll be happy to introduce you to our friends at urban timber can you call up that tweet we got yesterday about the dog the dog named hey this is you buddy apex apex such a good dog Apex is such a good doggy. Apex, it turns out, and his human family members are big fans of Real Talk. And a big shout out to Chris Cromwell uh, from from the BIPOC Outdoors podcast. Yeah, uh, Chris this is amazing. Shot he, us. Says, <laughs> he says Apex up from a dead sleep when the Apex automation ad on Real Talk read comes on. <laughs> so I let Chris know how much we appreciated her tweet because it turns out that every time Apex hears me say Apex... Apex, such a good doggy. Apex jumps up in the back seat of the car and is thrilled about the Apex Automation ad reads. Uh, should I tell you a bit about Apex Automation or should we just celebrate the dog? I think so. I think our friends at Apex Automation would want us to remind you that they're hiring nonstop. As a matter of fact, they've been growing their team almost tripled in size over the past couple of years. Professional engineers across the country and from international jurisdictions that are coming to their offices in BC and Alberta and they're, they're opening in Ontario and down in Florida. They're working in the States. Why is their team growing so fast? Because they're finding a way to give their clients back their time. They're investing in testing out systems on Apex headquarters uh, before they send them out into the field for installations it eliminates costly uh, delays and of course it allows the team at apex to train up those that are going to be using this automated technology fascinating stuff right now if you're watching on youtube we're showing you a system that is automating sag d facilities uh, doing a ton of work in canada's energy industry if you're looking for a new career as a professional engineer check out apexautomation.ca at the 16 Friesen Brothers locations across the province of Alberta, they are taking orders right now for their inspired uh, Ukrainian Christmas dinner boxes. We had one just the other day in advance, and I can let you know the price you're going to pay for this, $60 to feed four people. You can't Ooh. beat it anywhere. We're talking like a classic Ukrainian Christmas feast, turkey, pierogies, lazy cabbage rolls, pie, dinner rolls. You, John, like the list goes on. $15 a person to, to, to leave all the work 
to their team of Red Seal chefs. You pop it in the oven, you heat it up, and it's ready to go. If you have 40 people coming over, just order 10 dinner boxes. It's that simple. You can place your order today at Friesen.com. That's F-R-E-S-O-N.com. If you're one of those that's been slipping and sliding around the highways, if you lose a little confidence in your vehicle every single time it snows, can can we implore you to go see our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge today? Can we encourage you to do that? They're, of course, those that have the best selection of the Jeep brand. That's the most trusted SUV in North American history. Plus, they've got great specials on right now with that Dodge Ram 1500. Uh, a great sales event up to $10,000 in total discounts on the 2022 Ram 1500, including that classic edition, the best bang for buck in the half-ton market at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. And if you're looking for a perfect way to celebrate the season, nothing does it like a custom cake from a Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton or Sherwood Park. We're talking Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. The Dairy Queen cakes, of course, you can go with the Blizzard cake. I recommend the treats, a pizza. It's phenomenal. But it's this classic soft serve with that cookie crumb center. Everybody bound to love it, regardless of what you're celebrating. And if you're out and about making that the holiday rounds, running those errands, and you need to crush some hunger, nothing does it like a signature stack burger from the Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton or Sherwood Park. My recommendation this week, John, is the bacon two cheese deluxe i guarantee you here's the guarantee i make when you pull it out of the packaging it's going to look exactly like it does on the website and not every place can say that <laughs> you just whenever you're talking about freezing bros when you're talking about dairy queen i get pretty excited about i just i, can't, I feel tired yeah. you know the holidays are coming i know we're gonna do what we always do which is eat far too much but I, but i'm still looking forward to it you're dreaming of the dairy free dilly bars <laughs> just say it just say it <laughs> we've got a lot of irons in the fire coming up on uh, tomorrow's show and friday we wanted to remind you of course that friday will feature a trash talk where it'll be your real emails sent to talk at ryan so like mark said here he said more of this stuff more real life less politics you think we could do a politics free trash talk on friday <laughs> uh, no nah, i don't think so there's too much going on but, but still if there's something in real life that's driving you nuts let us know and don't forget it's wednesday a new episode of seriously ready to download we'll see you soon real talk is hosted by ryan jesperson Executive Producer, Josh Dunford. Technical Producer, John Hicks. General Manager, Katie Cook Chivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepard. Website Design, Mike Johnston. VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.